All right, let's 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 go through this. Um, similar questions to last time, similar format anyway, to the, uh, oh, I didn't put it up. Okay. Similar format to last time, slightly different questions. So this time you just had to name it. You didn't have to find the errors. Um, what is the functional group here? Obviously, a it's a diol, right? And then you also have a, an alkene to deal with and a little bit of stereochemistry. So let's get the overall name first. Um, what would you come up with? It's kind of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons long, right? So that's going to be an oct something or other. Was it, was it Z? Uh, well, let's just get this part first. It's an octene diol of some sort, right? So it's going to be an oct, uh, one, two, three, four, five, oct, six, ene, one, six, diol. And then uh, before that, we also have dimethyl, right, for these two things. And now it's uh, numbers. Or now it's stereochemistry, so let's figure out that. First of all, uh, what stereochemistry do we need to account for? Two chiral centers on three and four and the alkene uh, over here. Right. So let's do the alkene first. Is that E or Z? That is Z. Why is it Z? Right, so you're looking at, at each carbon. You find what has the higher priority, and the oxygen does over this carbon. And then on this side, the carbon over the hydrogen. So they're on the same side. That makes it Z. All right, and then let's look at these two stereo centers. Um, this one here, your first priority is here, then two, then three, and that makes it S. So that's going to be three S. And then the other one is the opposite. So it's going to we're going to have uh, priority one, two, three, four R Z. Um, it should be in there because it's part of the stereochemistry. I will mark you down for it on, on this on this one, yeah. But but stereochemistry all goes in those parentheses. In fact, even if there are no uh, other chiral centers, it should the Z or the E goes in parentheses on its own. No, you could put the number by the Z. In this case, we don't just because there's only one of them. But you could, and if there were more multiple double bonds, then you certainly would. The alcohol, I know it takes precedence on the, the counting, but yeah. for me it's two, so the, the singular alcohol would take precedence over the one with the hill bond next to it? Well, you go with whatever gives you the lowest numbers in that case. So if you started counting from the other side, it would be a 3-8 diol, and if you start from this side, it's a 1-6, so that's the only difference there. Uh, yeah. Okay, next one, mechanism. Um, basically the same mechanism as I gave you last time, just a different uh, different substrate. We went through that one together last time, so um, this guy attacks the uh, carbonyl. I'm just going to abbreviate this PR for propyl. And you know what I'm saying if I do that? Okay. Yeah. And then um, you reform the carbonyl, so you form the ketone, uh, kicking off the other alcohol. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, in these ring opening or cleavage type reactions, usually you just draw them in the same format until the end, and then you can stretch it out and make it look good. Okay, so now we've got something like this. And whether or not you protonate that end um, now or later is, is whatever. So then another Grignard will come along and attack. So 
you have something like that. Okay. And then you protonate that twice. So your final product should be um, something like this. So you'll have this alcohol, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. One, two, one, two three, five, six, seven, eight. The other propyl over here. And your other alcohol there, and then a methyl group. Wait, does protonation always happen? It depends. It depends on the reaction. How do you know what the water Depends on what's around, like solvent, for instance, because it has to actually get the proton from somewhere, right? So, pro, pro, I'm saying that, like, what I what I did was I, I added like I added the C the the uh, propyl group, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then I pro, protonated and then I. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. If you get the basic idea of the mechanism, I would still give you credit for it. The reason that might not be technically correct in this instance is that you know we know that we can't have alcohols present in Grignard solutions because the Grignard was simply deprotonated. And so that means, remember, Grignard reagents are really strong bases. So whenever you're doing Grignard reactions, you need to be in, in a solvent that um, is aprotic, doesn't have any protons around, or the Grignard will just take them. Um, so in this case, if you protonated that and made the alcohol, then your Grignard would just deprotonate it again mm -hmm. before it would. So it wouldn't actually exist as an alcohol, really, in the presence of a Grignard reagent. That's why I didn't draw that here. In other situations where we've seen this, um, the Grignard attacks, and then you add some, you add like water, mm -hmm. and that gives you a source of protons that, they, that you can then protonate with. Right, so that wouldn't that wouldn't actually work, and that that's not part of the reaction here because water is actually a second step. So after you add all of the Grignard, then water is added. If you have water there and you protonate it, if you have OH there and a Grignard in the same spot, that's a problem because that Grignard will never attack where you want it to if there's a proton around for it to attack. That's right, but. Right. In the mechanism, we generally want to be specific as to how those things are happening and when. Other questions about that? Good, good questions, though. All right. And then here we have a, a synthesis problem. Um, how did you think about this? What's going on here? Yeah. All right. Um, so I started with uh, a methyl and GPR. Well, let's... Um, Let's talk about sort of the over, your overall plan or your. Okay, so I saw that there was another carbon added. Okay, is that what you were saying too? Mm -hmm. So you got to add one more carbon, and then ultimately getting rid of oxygen, the oxygen here in some way. All right, so that's that's your general plan. Um, let's stick with the backwards plan here. We saw this as a reduction, which means that you probably have something like this in terms of a couple steps, but something like that, right? What, and then um, we know that we can do this through Grignard chemistry. Right. So how'd you fill in this last bit then? What uh, kind of plans did you use for that? Hmm? Go ahead. and then yeah. Okay, so a couple ways to do this. You could you could make a tosylate or turn it into some kind of leaving group like chloride or bromide and then uh, eliminate. And what kind of base would you use to eliminate? A uh, large base. What did you use? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, yeah, with the base, pyridine. You would need to generally use a base in this situation as well, um, like 
triethylamine or something. Um, but if you get the major reagent, I, I don't really care if you have the other extra stuff generally. Okay, so that's the quiz. Nice job. Maybe. I don't know. I didn't actually look at your answers, but I hope it went well for you. To finish off this chapter, then, um, we talk about oxidation of alcohols. <coughs> so just to review, we've talked about preparations of alcohols, we've talked about reduction to alcohols, reduction of carbonyls to alcohols, and we've talked about some substitution elimination reactions of alcohols. So now we're going to get into the oxidation of alcohols, that is, these types of reactions. And the symbol that's usually used for oxidation is an O with brackets about around it. That's a general term that isn't a specific reagent. That's just saying we do some oxidation. We're going to go through some of the specific oxidants. Um, in some cases, any oxidation will work. and In some cases, you want a very specific set of reagents. So let's look at some of those. Whoops. Now you'll notice here that this is a secondary alcohol. And it has been oxidized into a ketone. What happens if you have a primary alcohol? And can an aldehyde be itself be oxidized? It can, yeah, it can be oxidized further to a carboxylic acid. And that idea is going to form a, a big part of uh, some of the chemistry we're about to talk about. What happens if you want one of those versus the other? A secondary, aldehyde, or secondary alcohol doesn't really matter. You're oxidizing it, you're getting a ketone all the time. But a primary alcohol, you can either get an aldehyde or an acid, depending on the strength of your oxidant. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about a bit. And then what about a tertiary alcohol? What happens if we oxidize that? Anybody? Yeah, th no, in this case you get nothing. Tertiary alcohol can't be oxidized um, because well, what, what would happen? If you tried to make a carbonyl or something, you'd have a carbon with five bonds. So the main point of that, actually the, the main definition there, remember we often define oxidation and reduction in terms of adding or losing hydrogen. Uh, since there's no hydrogen on this carbon, you can't actually lose that. And when we go through the mechanism of oxidation, you'll see it's very similar to an elimination mechanism. So you need that hydrogen actually to get it to work. All right, let's talk about some actual reagents here. One major um, oxidant is this molecule here. Which is H2CRO4. What's that? What's the name of that? That's chromic acid. Um, chromic acid is not something you not, you buy and keep around because it's pretty dangerous, and um, and it also just doesn't last for very long because it reacts with pretty much everything. So we don't actually add chromic acid as a reagent usually to do an oxidation. We there are two possible um, commonly used things that you put together and you form the chromic acid in situ. 
So you can have um, chromate, which is or chromium trioxide, CrO3, with acid. So you might see chromium trioxide, water, and sulfuric acid, or something like that, those kinds of conditions. Um, you may also see the ion sodium ionic compound, sodium dichromate. Again, usually also with acid. And those things form chromic acid when you put them in solution and then you do that sort of in your reaction. So you don't actually have that. Um, so you don't, you're not adding that separately. OK. And you can look, I'm not that concerned about the mechanisms of that, of those specific formations. But let's look at how that, how the chromium oxidations actually work. You take your alcohol. Let's use a secondary one for now. And this actually reacts quickly and reversibly with chromic acid. To, so it's not really a true mechanism because we're not detailing every little step, but you get the idea here. And the chromic acid binds actually to that uh, alcohol oxygen, or the uh, this attacks the chromium, and you end up with something like this. We haven't really talked about these types of addition mechanisms, so. We won't go through the specific arrows right now. Then the important part is what happens next is like an elimination reaction. <clears throat> so water deprotonates that hydrogen, forming the carbonyl. and getting rid of the uh, chromate, uh, chromite ion. So that then gives you hydronium down here from that deprotonation. Then you've got your ketone here. That's the important part. And then the byproduct is bichromite ion. And so you can see that now the alcohol is oxidized, and actually the chromium is reduced as well. The two electrons went to the chromium, um, reducing it in a more traditional sense. We talk about electrons um, with oxidation and reduction. And that's, that's how it works. OK? All right. Yes? Yes? No. Um, Actually, you're forming hydronium, not H2. Um, you're, so the reversibility is actually this. Um, well, remember that, oh yeah, sort of. <laughs> this OH basically replaces this. And so you have water, actually, as the byproduct here an H from here and the OH from here. And this oxygen ends up bound to the chromium. Yeah. And that's why it's reversible, because it's um, you're not losing anything from solution there. And that goes back and forth. All right, the, the tricky part about this then becomes, so this is fine, but what happens when you have a, pr a primary alcohol? When you try a chromate oxidation with a primary alcohol, so let's say 
we use uh, sodium dichromate with some sulfuric acid and water. You'd say, okay, I do this mechanism, I get this oxidation. I should have my aldehyde. But in fact, the aldehyde exists only transiently. So it's actually very difficult or near impossible to isolate. And instead, what you tend to get is the carboxylic acid. So the primary alcohol ends up being oxidized to the acid. Which is great if you're trying to make carboxylic acids. Um, less great if you're trying to make aldehydes. So other type, other um, types of oxidative conditions were developed to be a little bit weaker and actually stop there. And the most common one that's used is known as PCC. And we'll talk about what that is. It stands for Pyridinium chlorochromate. So there's the PCC. Pyridinium is a pyridine with that's been protonated. So there's pyridine, there's pyridinium. And then chlorochromate is CrO3 Cl minus. So there's your salt. And that's actually also produced from chromium trioxide and HCl. So that's a milder oxidant that will give you the aldehyde. We usually do this in methylene chloride just because that's a solvent that will dissolve this stuff well. Not cause any bad side reactions. And that's how you make um, aldehydes from primary alcohols. Now, if you have a secondary alcohol, you can actually go either way. Because there's only one possible oxidation product, you can either use one of the chromic acid conditions. So either chromium trioxide and acid or sodium dichromate and acid. Or you can use the PCC route. Why might you use one over the other? Well, generally you would use, um, it would kind of depend on your reaction, your conditions. PCC is a bit more expensive. Um, chromic acid, those chromic acid conditions are pretty cheap. So you take those kinds of considerations in, into account. But as, in terms of uh, paper chemistry, they're, they're do, they do the same thing. When I talk about paper chemistry, I'm not talking about the chemistry of making paper. I mean, when you're writing these things out on exams and I should call it dry chemistry or something. I don't know. Okay. So let's look at a couple uh, syntheses that will involve these and see what we can come up with. The major um, synthetic advantage that you have now is a much 
more versatile way of making ketones, aldehydes, and acids. Before, all we had was um, oxidative cleavage, which is a little bit of a clunky reaction because you've got to have a, long, a bigger molecule and then break some of it off. Or hydration of alkynes, which again, it's not always convenient to use alkynes. Um, alcohol chemistry is a much more convenient way to go about doing things. You know a lot about alcohol chemistry. So um, try something like this one. And then if you finish that off, um, give this one a try too. See if you can do it those that are pretty with them. This must have come from here using uh, one of the conditions above. So let's say chromium trioxide and acid. And then if you got that, you then know how to make the alcohol. How would you do that? Yeah, you could. Um, Hydrate the alke alkene. Okay. So this next one now um, also shows why it's very powerful to now be able to make ketones and aldehydes. In effect, what this looks like is you're adding three carbons, right? But there aren't really any good substrates that add carbons to a carbon with an alcohol. That's not an electrophile. That's not really something that a Grignard or anything like that can attack. However, uh, ketones and aldehydes certainly are. So you might see this as coming from a Grignard reaction with this ketone Oops. like that. There's a nice way to add those carbons, right? And then once you see that you have the ketone and know that that can come from the alcohol, you can again do that oxidation with whatever conditions you prefer. So when I talk about general oxidation that doesn't matter which is which, I'll often just write that as use whatever you want. Can we do that Sure, as long as it's in a general context like this where it really doesn't matter that you use one versus the other. Oh, yes, and use this then as the Grignard to attack the other aldehyde. For the first one. Oh, for this one. So you, you have a bromine here, and then a Grignard, and then what do you do with that? So you have this. Um, no, not in this case. This becomes a nucleophile now that can go react with some other ketone or aldehyde. But there's no way to, to get an alcohol there then. Yeah. That, that wouldn't be a reaction that that could do. OK. Other questions about those? All right, that's about it for chapter 13. I do want to direct your attention to this thing that comes at the end. There's this big figure of how to do all this stuff that we've talked about now. Alkynes, alkenes, alkanes, ketones, alcohols, alkyl halides, how to switch all among them. I think figures like this are great summaries, but there's a tendency to sort of see something like this as the answer. And if I just remember all these reactions, I'm good. Um, I would encourage you to think a little more, bit more deeply than that when you're doing your studying. Uh, in other words, if you see something like this, and you see that some of these can be done with a couple different things, do you understand why those things, why you might choose one over the other? What is the difference between them? Why do some work in some situations and not others? What are the drawbacks? Could you draw the mechanisms for these reactions? Could you actually fill in a diagram, something like this? Um, 
So those sorts of things. Don't put this on a card and just figure if I remember all this, I'll be good. Because there's a lot more behind this. I mean, we've spent a good amount of time either in this class or last semester talking about each of those reactions. And we did that for a reason. Because if this were the answer, I could just give you this. And then we'd all you know, not have to spend so much time all semester. Um, so use this as a tool, certainly. But when uh, remember that there's a lot going on behind each of these reactions and make sure that you have a good handle on, on that as well. All right, let's move on. So let's get into that. I do want to get into chapter 14 a bit, and that's ethers uh, and epoxides. Well, it started with just talking about properties of alcohols, but yeah. This chapter also includes talking about some sulfides and thiols. We're not going to spend much time on those. More important is the ethers and epoxides. Um, what is an ether? It's a functional group. Everybody remember that? Right. So things like this. This is going to be our most common ether. Diethyl ether. And that's right. And this is the one that is just known as ether as a solvent. Right. We we always assume that this is diethyl ether. Whenever you, whenever you see a prep that just says we did this in ether, it's always assumed to be diethyl ether. Uh, been around for a long time. It was used as an anesthetic for a long time, but with, with pretty unpleasant results. Because when you come out of an ether, um, if you've been anesthetized with ether, either um, willingly or unwillingly, when you come to, there's a lot of nausea and vomiting and stuff involved. So other, an an other uh, an uh, what trying to say? anesthetics have come that are much, much nicer. This is diethyl ether. Actually, diethyl ether, of course, is what we're always going to call it. But that's actually not a systematic name. That's considered a common name. Um, ethers are often named by their substituent groups. And the common name is to name each substituent and then say ether. So this would be known as methyl Phenyl ether. But that's actually not a systematic name, although it's common for small ones. The systematic name is to have a parent and then name the oxygen part as an oxy. So the systematic name here would actually to be called to call this methoxy. Benzene. And to make things even more complicated, benzene, simple benzenes uh, often have their own common names as well. So this molecule is also known as anisole, um, which has nothing to do with its structure. But if you have a small, simple ether like these, either name is generally considered fine. If you have much longer, bigger things, it often gets too complicated. So um, something like this would certainly not be named as an ether or a diether or something. Uh, it is an ether, but we would name it as a um, three ethoxy five. methoxy heptane. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, physical properties of, of ethers. Yes, they have an oxygen, but they're not as polar as you might think that they are. Um, ethers cannot hydrogen bond because they don't have any OH bonds. So let's So no hydrogen bonding, which means they won't, yeah. Uh, but I'm sorry, this is probably not really relevant, but could, if, if they, if there's an OH group, mm -hmm. uh, could they, could they hydrogen bond to that as a, as a single, as a single one-time thing? No, not, not exactly. Um, you need actually both, you need the OH bond. Otherwise, it's not polar enough. Like a CO bond is not polar enough to hydrogen bond to an OH bond. Like the oxygen isn't negative enough. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I, 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 I was taught that um, it could do one bond because the oxygen bond is so. Like not. EV. I mean, it, certainly they're miscible. But like ethers, if you mix, not diethyl ether, but some ethers, if you mix with water, They'll, um, yeah, like it, but it's like it's not like continuous. But it's, it's a dipole-dipole interaction. It's not a, really a true hydrogen bond. It's an interaction of it's a it's an attraction of plus of partial positive and partial negative. But it's not a true hydrogen bond. I think. I'll look it up. That's so what the book says. What? what? If it what? Well, again, you need that. Yes, you need the bonds to hydrogen. So you need an NH something on there or an OH something. Um, yeah, sure. Sure. Then that would take over and, and that would give you the hydrogen bond. Yeah, I don't think... It's unlikely. I mean, even thinking about physically using it. If you put ether and water shake them up, like in an extraction, mm -hmm. they separate right away. So they're not even miscible. Um, you'd think if there, if there were some hydrogen bonding possible that you would be able to break up the water um, hydrogen bonds. But I, I have another question, but I'll just wait until after. Maybe not. OK, yeah. well, we can look it up and, and check for sure. I'm, I'm not really I'm not 100% sure, but that's just what I think. Certainly no hydrogen bonding with, within itself. Let's, we can, we can yeah. certainly say that, right? I, I, yeah. So these have slightly elevated uh, boiling points to comparable um, alkanes, but not huge, not hugely different, and certainly not as, as big as um, alcohols. So for instance, if you take ethanol, boiling point of ethanol is about 78C. If you compare that to dimethyl ether, which actually has the same formula, right? the boiling point of dimethyl ether is minus 25 C. It's gas room temperature. And then the boiling point of propane, which has a similar molecular weight, whoops, is minus 42. So the addition of oxygen gives you some polarity, but you still have a, um, you still don't have particularly strong intermolecular interactions compared with what happens when there's hydrogen bonding. So that's, um, that's a major uh, part of ethers is their relatively low but usable boiling points in a lot of cases. And then common ether solvents that you've seen, or maybe haven't seen, but are often used. Are, of course, diethyl ether. Also, tetrahydrofuran, or THF. And dioxane. Um, dioxane's been in the news a lot as a pollutant. You find a lot of them in uh, fish. A lot. That's a lot of the reason why fish from certain areas shouldn't be eaten or shouldn't be eaten very often because of the dioxane that accumulates in them. It's a really good solvent, so it was used for a long time in industry and then it's just sort of dumped wherever. It's 
So now we all get to drink it and eat it and all of that. Um, these solvents are good for a lot of reasons. They have reasonable boiling points, right? Ether is a low boiling solvent, so it's nice for room temperature type reactions. THF is about 85 uh, boiling point, so a little more on dioxane has a higher boiling point than that. They're very unreactive. They don't, they're aprotic solvents, uh, so they don't interact. They're, they're great reagents for Grignard reactions, for other types of organometallic reactions. Um, and they're relatively easy to get out of your stuff because they tend to be pretty low boiling, so you can rotovap them away. Uh, there is one big problem with them is their propensity to form peroxides. So you'll notice when we use ether upstairs, there's always labels on the bottles that say, warning, peroxide former, dispose of by a certain date. We actually check all our ethers regularly for peroxides because peroxides are explosive. So if you um, let an ether sit for too long, it'll form a bunch of peroxides. It's actually OK if it's still wet. But if it dries out, it leaves perox solid peroxide salts. Those are explosive. And so we check them for that. And you have to get rid once an ether bottle of ether has been opened, you have to get rid of it within, I think, uh, three months or something, or it can form dangerous levels of peroxides. All right. Um, I guess that's all the time we have. Next time, we'll get into crown ethers and epoxides and some chemistry.